Hey everyone, it's Bailey Wiki, and it's release day, November 2024, and uh, oh boy, I think you're going to like this. We are introducing Scenescapes, totally inspired by the new Vistas that the Foundry team introduced with Ember, but these are game and system agnostic, and totally fun to make, basically putting your, your players' characters into like point-of-view scenes. So I've released a full tutorial on Scenescapes today, so I encourage you to check it out. I'll link to it from the description, including the premium assets uh, that all the Foundry tiers get access to. I talk about them there and some in here. Jump ahead to the timestamps. Uh, but not just that, we've completely redone the Magic Tower with huge new, like, high-detailed rooms, effects, interactions for your players, loads of new magical assets with everything, of course, also available for Dungeon Draft tiers, so you can design your own maps in there, too. And the 3D scenes this month are, as usual, a useful sampling for any adventure. So that's it. Let's jump in and check it all out. Okay, so in terms of where to find the new content, you're going to upload all of your BaileyWiki modules um, and including the landing pages modules because that's what's going to include any Scenescape stuff if you're a subscriber. Uh, just as a reminder for this month, uh, the landing page module will, will be set to... Uh, basic foundry content just so everybody can play around with it just realize that it may uh, update to advanced foundry content at some point in the future not sure yet depends on how much um, progress we can make on it um, over this next period of time but just keep that in mind i also want to update nuts and bolts and mass edit as well because mass edit is going to be what enables uh, a lot of this as usual to get to the scenes if you're uh, want a 2d scene it's under the 2d scenes just type in 2d in your compendium search there and 3d scenes uh you're going to have the bailiwicky 3d scenes here as well in terms of where the new prefabs and everything else are they're all all the token attached prefabs have been converted to mass edit based prefabs so you can find them all here in the tile tab but if you want to search for everything new just go to the all tab and type in pound new that'll force a tag search and you can see all of the new presets and prefabs, including all of the scenescape stuff. And then you can see all of the new tiles uh, and everything else that went in further below. So there's, there's quite a bit. There's also a couple of new sounds down below as well. Uh, basically office sounds for the library, both with, with voices and without voices, both from Michael Gelfi. Okay, so let's walk through some of the scenescapes first. This one is a um, like a campsite. And so this has a bunch of the free assets, including these tokens are also free as well. You can also find these characters for free. There's one premium one that's the mage. If I just drag him out onto the scene, that's what he looks like. Uh, but the free ones here, the, the barbarian, uh, mage, and rogue, they're all free as well. And then they've got a bunch of free um, versions of them. So if I uh, double right click, go to appearance, and go into their folder, I can see all the different poses and expressions available uh, with the different characters. And they are set up in the same square format. We'll figure out maybe how to consolidate. There's condenses later. But right now, I just wanted an easy way to change their appearance without having their, um, you know, them squish or their uh, height and width get skewed at all. But you can see all the different pieces here. You can put you know, this tree in the background, you can move that around. Uh, you've got, you know, these like rocks, uh, you've got your fireplace, even this tree here kind of set in the foreground. Also got this scene. It's also free. Uh, and remember you can generate or with AI, or you can download from the internet, all the backgrounds that you want. You can still use all these components, but this just has, you know, a couple of lamps, uh, your players can go, uh, in front of or behind these buildings. Uh, you know, there's a little vendor stall over there. So plenty of stuff to play around with. Um, you've got players all the way in the back. Uh, you've got this bridge here that they can uh, use, that kind of thing. And then in terms of the premium scenes, you've got this, this thing here. This is to go with the magic tower. So we have a mage's tower. This is our mage right here. He's got a couple of different um, 
he's also available as a token. They're all available as top-down tokens. Um, but he will uh, host your players in his big, you know, dining room. He's got these floating candles, you know, floating around the scene. They're sl- subtly animated here. So you can populate this with your own characters. You know, this table is its own thing, right? Its own prop. Um, so take a look at how I set it up and the different pieces and let me know what kind of props and things you'd like in the future. I do have uh, this character twice just to show that you can give them seating positions and have them you know, sitting in a scene as well. I love it. I love everything about it. So really cool, really fun stuff. If you do want to get to all the premium scene, scenescape stuff, just look up scenescapes and you'll get everything in here. Remember, you can expand this out, this window, and you can see all of the different uh, types of decor items that you can drop in there. I mean, you just double click it and you use alt to, and remember to just watch the uh, tutorial here. You can play stuff in your scene that way. Okay. In terms of the inventory scene, let's walk through it. Here's a bunch of the magic and arcane items. These are arcane machines of different varieties. These are relatively large tiles. I've scaled them down here, but I just wanted them to be very flexible. So you can scale them up or down. You can cover them with effects. You'll see how I use some of the electric sway effects here on some of these pieces, but they all go together pretty well. Whenever you see this white box, it means there's uh, some sort of prefab built with it. So if you look up this name, uh, within mass edit, you can find this vat, for example, this vat happens to be uh, mat enabled. So when you click it, it makes the top disappear for players. You can put things underneath it. That's an overhead tile. So you can put tokens within that vat. Here's all the components. These are um, non-transparent and transparent versions of the same thing in case you want to put something in it. These vats uh, are part of the components of what made this happen, but they're colorable, so you can really kind of have any kind of a colored ooze that you want. I even made this special tile here where even if it's not uh, one of my pieces of artwork and you want to make colored ooze, you can do that with using that tile. You can make it even semi-transparent if you'd like. Uh, other uh, arcane devices, electrodes, pieces of a robot. Uh, these telescopes are very large. They will uh, go very, very big. And you can put these telescopes um, either as a small thing inside of a room or you can make a whole uh, scene out of it. Lots and lots of different kinds of crystal balls just really kind of let you vary things up. Look for something that, you know, gives you some inspiration for, you know, where your players are and what kind of magical device somebody might find. You can also use them to uh, dress up a scene, make a scene look like it's got more, you know, like uh uh, finishing pieces, you know, on, on stair railings and things like that. Uh, continuing on, we've got distillers. These are really easy and fun to use. These can work in a lot of different campaigns and you've even got these really nice distillers that you can scale down and, you know, have experiments going on, uh, somewhere. I've used some of these later in the release. We've got different kinds of globes, which globe I use as a loose term. These are really more decorative pieces, just like with the crystal balls, just something to give you, and we've got actual globes, uh, but something to give you something to dress the scene up with. And that's really a big goal of this, this release is generate a lot of objects could, that could be things of interest. You know, these are just magic objects, right? You can really tell any story you want around these, apply some effects, make them float in the air. And they're just very effective for dropping in if you want to have some kind of point of interest. Here's orreries kind of in their finished component. These scale up well. And then the orrery components, which you'll see here, used here. So we've got uh, this animated uh, prefab. You'll see it's spinning in two different directions. These planets are also um, token magic effects. So that's why they're like floating out here is they're actually applied to a tile and then they're sprites that just kind of rotate around. You can move this whole thing around. You can cut and paste it and put it into any scene that you want. Of course, you can resize it as well. You can make it very tiny and big, whatever you're trying to do to tell your story. A uh, couple other things just to have some more regents and what we call tinctures just kind of sitting around um, to be able to have a little bit more magic stuff in your environment. 
For magic stuff, we've got actual magic books. These are on pedestals. These tend to have spells in them, so they're great little spell books. They do scale up as well in case you want to zero in on them. And then I've got what I call these discoverables. So you can uh, click it, and it's mat enabled. And you can see the logic attached to them. So, you know, you can click it or you can double right click it. If you click it, there's a 50% chance uh, to be successful finding it. This is just a real simple kind of poor man's like a uh, game system agnostic sort of ability to have things discoverable. You don't have to go with these. You can change this logic. You can have it do other things besides play that sound or show the book. You can open a journal entry, but I just put the logic in here so you didn't have to kind of invent it yourself. But if you double right click it, at least for these two, the scroll and this book, it will randomize the artwork. So if you uh, just wanna get a random scroll, there's a lot of these. If I click into this, and I see all the different scrolls available. There's a lot of different, these are scroll cases in this case, uh, a lot of different things that you can use. It'll also randomize to scrolls. Pens and quills, you can always use some of these. These are also, these feathers are great if you want to put these into a nest or something like that, but just plenty of writing implements for you to uh, put down in your scene. Here's some bloody parchments, definitely good for plot hooks. You can have these also, you can click on these to make them, you, know, you have to do the mat work yourself, but uh, click on them to make them discoverable. Lots of other pieces here. These are all composites uh, where some of them are slightly uh, split out, but this is just to be able to really quickly throw some spells down on the floor. Uh, not to skip by these, these are token magic effects uh, tiles, um, floating tiles. So when I said that it, we had applied effects, there's some effects applied to here, to this tile. And if I click open my TMFX mass edit thing, I can see all the different effects or uh, sprites that are applied to it. And I can change all different kinds of things about them, their scale and other stuff. It's super effective. And there's some um, macros that you can use to make those work. So if I go here and I just type in floating, I can find these special tiles. And if I double click it and drag it out, and I set it down, you didn't really see anything here uh, because it's actually a uh, overhead tile and it's transparent. And I did that just because, you know, maybe you don't want to have those tiles in front of you. And the thing is you can't hide them. Because if you hide them, uh, you didn't see it here, but to players it would actually hide the animation. And you may want to do that as a GM. You may want to hide uh, the animation or turn it on later. So that's how you use these. And uh, again, they they had some macros applied. So if you go into your new macros, uh, into nuts and bolts, and you just look up floating, you'll see all these different macros here. So if I select really any tile, it's like select this here, and I want to have you know floating books around it, I can just execute that macro, and it will make books float around that tile. The reason they're going underneath tiles is because this tile is uh, on the um, background. If I wanted them to be above everything, I'd make it like 10 feet above the ground. And now all these would be above everything else. And you can apply the one or the two um, in terms of the macros, right? So those floating macros. And this is just if you want to double up the books, the lights, or the planets on any particular tile. You can, I created both so you can have lots of uh, entities swirling around. All your scroll cases and your scrolls, you can find them all here. You can add them to brushes, right? Here's some open scrolls, uh, just like this. Here's some closed ones. So you can make brushes just out of the tiles and you can scatter them around scenes if you'd like. Different kinds of Gothic chairs and some sofas and ottomans. Just wanted something a little bit more leather look. Uh, we've also got some bookshelves. Now, these are set up perspective, so there's only certain places you're going to be able to use these, and that's going to be towards the edges of your maps. But I did want to be able to show some of that perspective, and you can see in the maps that we go to uh, where and how I use these. I think 
uh, as long as it's at the edges of your maps, um, I really like that it adds another dimension, even though we're kind of having to fudge perspective a little bit. At the end of the day, I think it works. Uh, we do have some fireplaces, some other things that you can throw into a scene. Uh, also got these magic circles. You can animate these, color them, make them semi-transparent. Same thing with these puddles. They're just very effective, scale up and down really, really well. Um, so just figured you guys just needed more of those kinds of things. Uh, we do have all of these statues here, which have some great gargoyles and other stuff. I really like all this, this set of hands. And I even made a hand with a floating token magic effects object. So if we double right click it, it will randomize not only the hand, but the object floating in it. In it. If you want to change that object to something else, you can. You just need to make sure that you... Uh, actually get rid of these extra images and that you turn this switch tile image off. That will let you then take control of the actual tile itself. And really any square tile can go in here. So you can put a floating book or like floating anything as long as the dimensions are square. In case you didn't know this, notice the little image hovering in the corner. It shows you the 300 by 300 um, dimensions of that tile. That means it's square. All right, now we're getting into the magic levels. These went into prefabs. You can drop these into other maps if you'd like, but I'll just kind of walk you through each one of them. We can come in through this entrance underneath this gargoyle. Uh, we come in here, we see that kind of floating orb. Maybe there's something about that. There is a staircase going down that doesn't go anywhere, and then a staircase going up. You'll notice that all of these scenes do have a teleport tile. And that teleport tile is already set up with a tag. It's a ge relatively generic tag. And it's set up to have tokens be able to enter and teleport somewhere else. Uh, when you're using the prefabs, you'll have to code these to where you want the destinations to go. So if you don't know how to do that, come to my Discord. This is just using Monk's Active Tiles to teleport. But you can see the basic setup here. And if you open it up, you can see how this is all set up. You don't really have to change anything except the coordinates. Just make sure that you're using tagger with whatever tag you're sending them to and just pop that in here. And now players will walk uh, and teleport to that, that spot if you ever need them to. It should probably be better to talk about with the scenes themselves. So uh, you've got all of the rooms, but let's just walk through them individually with the map notes on. And that'll help you uh, see what's involved. So this is our dining room. This is the one that we've got the uh, scenescape for, this idea that there's this dining room table with this large fireplace that sort of dominates the room. You've got different kinds of uh, items um, discoverable and whatnot around the room. These are like cases where you might have the idea of something in there. Uh, we've got these uh, overhead posts, which I love. So this is, you know, this idea that it's another way to immerse our players. And they can walk underneath these and they see this subtle hanging lamp. And I think it's just great. It's a it's a really cheap form of animation. And it just gives us something that the players can can feel like there's three dimensions around them in this giant, this giant room. Uh, I do have those transparent tiles here in the middle. They are overhead tiles if you have trouble clicking on them. And if you uh, hide them, it will hide the animated candles from your player. So maybe you want the candles to all of a sudden start animating, you know, when they're in the scene. That's how you can do that. Uh, and then you've got your uh, teleport pads here going both up and down. Now, any of these scenes, they do go in order. You can change the order, but that just means you have to change the teleport pads. I do recommend, too, you don't have to have teleport be automatic. If you don't want your players exploring the next scene, uh, well, you can disable this, right? So I just disabled that pad um, and then they can't use it. Maybe the door is locked down that hallway, right? Or it's magically shut and they can't access it. Once you're ready to let them teleport, if you want to do it at all, then you can just turn that back on. The library then is their next stop. This library has a bunch of stuff floating around. So idea of like a magic library. They come up here through this uh, staircase. They see these kind of swaying chandeliers overhead. They've got other sort of overhead tiles creating some immersion here. We've got the same kind of, you know, floating lamps and things like that. Uh, we've got um, this uh, floorboard that's broken here. As a GM, you can just single click it and change it. And if you right click it, you can change it to something else. So maybe you want a skeleton or there's a hole going into another level, or maybe you want to put an item in there, that kind of thing. But that's, that's all that is just a, 
a, a matte enabled tile. Lots of other things to discover around this room, or it's nice and big if you want to have an encounter. I really wanted to make this round of the magic tower much, much larger so you could have large encounters in here. And just as a reminder, these are, you know, these uh, transparent tiles are uh, located around here. And if you hit control A, it'll select everything. It'll just show you where the transparent tiles are hidden. So if you're looking for them and having a tough time finding them, maybe you want to get rid of them or hide them for a second. That's how you find them. Here we are uh, back to the hallways, this time uh, a little bit more stuff being called out here. We've got like these discoverable scrolls. Like here's a, here's a scroll that we can, you know, our players can click and discover. Same thing here, this book. Notice it's it doesn't act activate every time, right? It's only about 50% of the time that it'll click. You can change those to something else. There's other props and things. You've got this like little library area with another kind of subtle animation thing. These are all just props that I pulled in here. I wanted to have some magic potions. Uh, here's another thing that can be discovered, this crystal ball. More things around that you can explore. And then this scene here, this room here, this is, you can change it to anything, right? That's just a, an altar. And I have this like beating heart, right? So if you look up uh, beating, for example, you'll find this beating heart. And when you drag it out, uh, it will jump in your scene. It'll actually come with a beating sound. So there's a heartbeat sound that goes with it. Pretty great, right? But you can replace that heart with virtually anything. Just hit shift delete. It's a preset. It'll delete with all of its other components. You can drop something else in there. If you didn't notice, the players come up from this staircase and they can uh, make their way around here and all the way up to this staircase to make their way to the next level. Now you can always have teleports sitting somewhere else, maybe something magical that takes players to other parts of the tower. You don't have to follow a linear progression like you have here. But if they do go up that staircase, they end up here in this room. This is the automaton factory. And if they explore around this room, they'll see a bunch of cool stuff. So we've got a couple of different stations. You can drop in automatons if you have uh, tokens. I've got a few tokens uh, for automatons you can drop in there. Um, you can see as they get closer to this machine, they can hear some stuff. Well, they can actually turn the machine off. And there's a whole... As you can hear, like a sound sequence and other things. So maybe they arrive to this room and this machine is off. Um, and then they can find their way around to actually turn it on again. You can decide if you want to make this visible to them right away, or if you want it to be something, you know, maybe that they find later. As the players navigate up to the next level, they find the laboratory they can hear this gurgling sound as they walk near here you can see there are tokens just as samples inside of these vats so they can just kind of see what that looks like now that vat is closed it was in an open state and just some you know easy interactable elements uh we've got a tile here of Maybe it's a homunculus or an automaton or something. You can change this out for anything that you want. I just wanted to have some spaces where you could add some of these pieces. To make their way out, they come to this side of the room. I'm oh, sorry, this is where they come in. To make their way out, they go to the north side of the room. That will take them to the cages room. This is where presumably the subjects for all of the experiments are kept. Um, you've got some special things in this room, including the ability to put, you know, hide a subject or a token inside of these cages when cages are locked and that's all well and good. Um, you can see the couple of cages that this applies to these two over here and these over here. You can have other enemies spawn out from other areas in the room, but I didn't want to overbuild it with cages, but a nice big area to fight. You've got a couple of regions here that will automatically pop players up to the 10 foot level. And then if they get all the way over to here and they get near this lever, notice they have to be close to it, but if they get near it, it opens and unlocks all of the cages in the room. And then if you click it again, 
it locks all the cages. So you might have some fun with this. Maybe there's a big bad here that unleashes all of the, the creatures and they have to try to go close it before they all get out. But anyway, some fun stuff to play around with. Next up, they arrive in this hangar room. This is a hangar for an airship. So I'm going to show you here how its starting position, its starting point is. What that lever did is it opened up these doors here. Oh, sorry. Now that now it's open, you can reverse this just by launching this this way. Okay, so now the doors are closed, and you notice there's no sound of wind. When they're open, you'll hear sound of wind blowing through the door. You've got these lights kind of hanging above, and you have enough room for four players to get in this airship. So if we had all four players in there, I'll show you there's actually an active tile here. And if we activate the launch, it launches that airship is the idea and the players tokens just become invisible i didn't want to over uh, engineer this for you know to for you to have them like you know now launch and all of a sudden be another scene the reality is there's another scene that goes with this i'll show you here in just a second but we can reverse this and that's what that is for now if you want to just do that manually uh, if you right click this scene you can see it's really just two versions of the scene. One has an airship and the other one doesn't. Now, if they do launch into the airship, you can take them to this scene here. And you can pre-deploy your players into the airship. And this airship moves around. So it's an exact replica of what you just saw a second ago. And, you know, it's it's got some cool effects and, you know, this there's lights and stuff. You can turn the lights down and you you can even see it's got sort of a nighttime mode. And these clouds and everything else that are going by, these are actually overhead tiles and, and tiles underneath the, the airship. And so you can have some flying bad guys in here, um, but your players can ride around. They've got this cool like green light uh, kind of exposed on the airship. So anyway, hopefully you guys have some fun with this. After the hangar is the scrying pool. This is a remake of the old scrying pool. We've got a lot more space to work with now. So you've got some places with maps and other things for uh, maybe this is whoever the mage is, is scrying from this particular room. This is where he keeps his notes and his intel. Uh, the scrying pool itself has these like gorgons that are sort of submerged in this viscous fluid. And you've got this scrying ball here. So yeah, your players might have to wade out in this viscous fluid in order to spy it's supposed to be just kind of a chilling gross sort of thing right uh they do come up from this staircase here and then they would uh continue on up through this staircase so we're going to drop our player in and there's not much happening with the orrery at the moment but if we get near this lever and push it The lights will all change. They'll center in the room and the Ori will come on. You'll hear this nice little uh, mechanical noise playing in the background. So just a fun thing for them to discover. Maybe there's some kind of really cool celestial event happening and they get some clues on it when they get to the top of the tower. Now, there is a roof that will go on this tower as well. If you just look up Magic Tower 2024 roof, you'll find it. And this just, if you uh, you end up wanting to put this tower in another scene maybe you want to put a couple of the levels i wouldn't recommend putting all 10 levels in a scene but you have a roof that you can put on top and that roof is colorable so you can uh give it a tint um, using the dungeon draft stuff to something else okay so that's it for the 2d foundry release let's hand it over to swift to talk about the 3d stuff Hi guys, Swift here again to talk about the 3D side of November's release. We've got a couple of pretty stylish maps this month using the new interiors um, asset pack that we released last month. So let's have a quick look at the maps we have in the 3D side this month, starting with the Yawning Portal. The Yawning Portal is a very classic D&D location. For those unaware, the general gist is that it's a tavern that is popular with adventurers in the city of uh, Waterdeep. And the key element of the tavern is that it has the Yawning Portal, or in other words, a very large hole that leads directly down into the Underduck. 
this is quite a dangerous thing to have around, so it's a good thing that the tavern is usually full of quite a lot of, lot of adventurers to deal with any sort of trouble that might come crawling out. But either way, this here yawning puddle was made by Lettuce, and is using the interior set, like I said, from just this month. We've got all the pieces of a tavern that you might need, the bar area, various seats on various levels, with a bit of the old clipping shader so that you can get underneath them nice and easily, as you can see. And we've also got some rooms up here, because every adventuring party's going to need to rest sooner or later, as well as the general cooking or cookery area. And then, of course, underground, or not, not underground, under the first floor, we have the storage area full of all of the supplies, as well as a couple of side rooms as well. Like there's a private dinner room over here in the corner with a door at the back. And then on the other side of the storage room, we have another little private side room with a nice big bench perfect for all of your clandestine meetings. Overall, I do always love a nice kind of fully featured tavern. I think it's the kind of thing that everybody could get some use out of, really. And of course, everyone loves a, a sort of well-known location like the Yawning Portal, for instance. With that said, let's have a quick look at the next map. This next one is also by Lettuce, and it is the Forest Road. So with this one, we were just looking at trying to get something that's very simple and kind of ubiquitous in basically any adventure you're going to run, which is going to be a road through a forest. We have a few of those, but, well, we'll always need more. So in this case, we have this old stone brick kind of cobble road through the forest that's obviously been worn away with time, overgrown with great many plants with even offshoots on the road that have been even more grown over with time. And in this case, it's a dark and stormy night, with, of course, a bit of a broken wagon in the centre of the road. Always a classic centrepiece. This map is another one of those very simple ones that I think is just kind of... There's not a lot you can say about them, but they are basically guaranteed to be useful. And in this case, we have a whole heck of a lot of trees. So what you'd want to do is either just view from high above or use the clipping shader to get the trees clipped out. And that would make playing on this map a lot easier. Certainly a lot easier than I'm making it look right now. That's the forest road, though. Let's have a look at what this road might lead to. And here we are at the Rural Temple, another map of lettuces. This one is something that I think we've been kind of needing is just more temple-y kind of locations. As this kind of implies, just by its size and the kind of way it's set out, this would be a more kind of rurally church kind of thing. It's not like a entire grand cathedral or anything. We've got the central idol, which of course, you know, is just a tile that you can switch around for any other given deity statue, depending on what you want this to be a temple to. You've got the confessional over by the side, I think is kind of cute actually, I do say so myself. And then, of course, the trapdoor down into the depths below, which, being as this is a fantasy setting, is usually something beneath the cathedral, or the church in this case. Overall, though, this map is a rather simple one. And, again, like I say, I do favour simple maps. With the way this is set up, this would be really easy to turn into any sort of ceremony going on with whoever, with something important to say up here at the front, speaking to the crowd. Perhaps it's the players, perhaps the players are the ones being spoken to. Either way, I think this is the kind of map that could get a lot of use. And we depart from the temple into the farmland. This is one of those diorama style maps, where the map is actually a slice of a world on a table, that I think is just really rather cool. It's one of those kind of styles of maps that I think always works. You don't necessarily have to worry about a in-depth surrounding countryside when the world itself is a sort of diegetic slice and it looks much more like something that you're actually doing at a table. I think that's a pretty great aesthetic. Speaking of great aesthetics, the map itself is, as mentioned previously, pretty simple but rather nice. We've got the sort of road through the countryside, the mill, with a door on there that can open up and you can use a uh, tag to sort of use that as a teleporter to other areas. And then various elevated areas with like paths between them and so on. And of course, the mandatory crashed wagon. We don't make the rules, there just always has to be a crash crashed wagon whenever there's a road. And then of course, the farms themselves, or the fields, freshly harvested, awaiting transport. 
this I think is one of those kinds of maps that's surprisingly easy to actually create. And I do intend to make a sort of tutorial video at some point. But like this terrain here was made in something like Blender or so on. But it's the kind of thing that anybody can do with like, you know, 10 minutes of tutorials and so on. And then we've just put a splat map shader on there to apply, say, the grass to the hill, the dirt to the road, and that sort of thing. And we've also got a variant of this map. Let's have a look at that. And this is the night variant of the uh, farmlands here. We've got a bit of a spooky green glow in the atmosphere there. Shadows covering the place. Though, of course, still well lit enough that you can actually see. Something I will say as well that's worth noting for maps like this that are relatively simple layout-wise, you can always press O in 3D Canvas to get a kind of top-down view. And from this sort of thing, you do get a pretty cool aesthetic, I think. Like, this is the sort of thing where you could even put down 2D tokens on this and it would look pretty cool. With the difference, of course, being that it is still in 3D, so you can, you know, move around and the perspective will change as you move around the area. But I think it's worth just sort of noting that the overhead camera, you just press O to get into this mode, uh, is definitely something that can add a little bit of style to it. Anyway, let's have a look at the next scene. And speaking of stylish, this is the Wonders on the Road map, also by Ufant, which I think has a pretty great use of colour here, just using the vibrant red for the bushes and this bright orange for the trees. Perhaps not strictly speaking realistic, but very cool looking, I think, especially with the interaction of the light inside it there, having the light and dark areas. But the actual map itself is a merchant camp of sorts. The road here comes up to this front store where they're selling all sorts of magical artifacts, books, potions, crystals, scrolls, rings, loads of little bits and bobs. And then behind that, of course, is the camp itself, which, of course, contains all the things that a traveling band of merchants might need, such as a central tent over here with some of the more valuable things inside it, some extra tents out here, several wagons, and then many, many crates full of all sorts of things. This, I think, is just a very cool map, really. Very simple, very clear in its purpose, but I think, you know, a great sort of idea piece for if you're thinking of, if your party are out in the wilderness and you'd like them to be able to have access to buying magical items, but going all the way back to civilization isn't really viable, then a scene like this might be a good way to kind of slide that into a campaign nice and diegetically, while also being kind of believable traveling merchants going somewhere, setting up camp, just so happening to come across a band of adventurers and setting up some stalls for them. Because, well, as we know, adventurers are very good for business, except for when they're not at the next one. This next map we're looking at is by Dr. Albi, and is the Underground Central Cave. This is quite a intricate and detailed kind of map, with a lot of different passageways in it, a very kind of old-style dungeon kind of situation. You've got places over here where the players could enter in through, like doorways and stairs, down or from wherever, leading into a central area where there are side passages which will lead to things like glowing crystals in this area over here, or the ruined old tower here embedded in the wall. And then, of course, the central area, which was clearly of some importance at some point. A smoky vent belies some sort of fiery place down below. And then, of course, the statues in the centre here, one of which has fallen. An ancient place of worship fallen into disrepair. Further beyond that, we've got another couple of passageways. One leading over here to our animated uh, sarcophagus situation here. Through the door, which just opens with a normal click. And then the sarcophagus here as well can be just opened with a click, or closed with a click, as the case may be. And then, of course, over in the other direction, we have... A passageway going down, down, and down, or up and up, depending on if this is where the players have actually come from, leading to another traditional site, the bridge into the abyss. So, if this is the kind of place that the players are traveling through on their way underground to some deep dark treasure, this could be an excellent, as the name implies, central cave. There's a couple of different ways out of here, and they could lead in completely different directions, or they could lead to the same sort of location. And this here is the flooded underground central cave, which, well, it's pretty obvious why it got its name. 
The smoky crevice in the previous version has actually been a waterfall in this one here, and has eroded away areas of the central cave. The platform itself is still standing, but there's no longer a clear path across to the other side. So, that's going to be some athletics checks for the players, unless they get clever with it. We still have the sarcophagus with the animated dragon head that may or may not spew fire at the players. And then over here, the chasm is actually flooded with water. Overall, though, a nice little variant of the other map. Instead of just being a day or night thing, it's a sort of flooded or not flooded. The area down the stairs is flooded as well. I thought I'd point that out as well. Though all of this is related to the next map, and this one here by Dr. Alby is the Underground River, which I think is another kind of cool setting for a adventure or a session that doesn't really get that much love. Just because it kind of implies that the underground is a kind of as rich and diverse place as the overground can be sometimes. It's not just either dungeons or solid rock. So in this case, you probably have the party arriving from this kind of corner here, and then making their way down the river, either around the water to this sort of bridged area over here, or down the kind of clearer area here, which may be less stealthy, depending on exactly what they're trying to do. And of course, there's all the good old staples like broken bridges, intact bridges, kind of flimsy looking bridges, and then passageways if they double back, like up here, leading to another one of these shrines. One of those statues from the central cave, but intact and with a chest, probably important. And then down on the other side, we have another passageway that leads out of the map, as well as just general details around this map that I quite like. Like, you know, the campfire here, with the torch just laying around with the wall set up. If the party end up going down this way and then back around this way, there could be someone waiting there to ambush them, or the party could be the ones doing the ambushing. And then, of course, there's the sort of river and the rapids inside there with all the foam spreading out. Quite easy to do in 3D camps, and I think with quite good effects, in case this is one of those very sort of close-in maps, I still think is quite easy to play as long as you've just got high angles with the camera there. And I think just more underground places is always good. But for a moment, let's head back above ground. So now that we're up here above ground, we find ourselves in the desert, in the Desert Mountain Pass specifically. This is a map by DigiDM, and is a rather nice desert map with a bit of elevation variation across the length of it here. As you can see, we've got a bit of a path coming from ground level, up and up to this higher area, and then through a pass. We've also got this stone hanging ominously in the air, which, uh, to the players, that would be invisible. And that's what these buttons down here are for. And so the idea with this one is that it's an animated asset that we've got here again. If you have a token selected, or well, if you just have this map here selected, and click on the green button, it will actually cause a boulder to roll on down the pass, which I think is a rather neat use of animated assets there. So that's the kind of thing that I think would be quite a surprise to players, because obviously having an animated boulder trap even in a 2D scene would be quite the thing. Here in 3D, it's just not really something we've seen before, so that's pretty cool. But even ignoring that there, it is just a nice little desert mountain pass. Something that I do like to see in deserty terrain is kind of rocky areas like this as well. It's not all going to be dunes and sand forever, of course. And this kind of increases the variety of scenes that you could make in, say, a desert adventure. But speaking of the desert, let's have a look at the next map. Speaking of endless dunes, here we are in the desert with the Pyramid Dungeon map, another one by DigiDM here. On the outside, it's uh, pretty straightforward. As you can see, it is a pyramid out here in the desert. We've got some more pyramids off in the distance there, presumably related tombs. And then right here, we have a door that leads inside. Which, of course, if I select the token I've got in there, hides the rest of the pyramid and lets you move around inside at will. So this is a very traditional kind of dungeon-styled experience here. We've got the winding corridors, the many doors, and the various sinking sand traps arranged into well, a nice, good old-fashioned dungeon. There's quite a lot to explore. Let me see if I can just hide the token's vision here, there we go. As you can see, it's a fairly extensive dungeon. There's quite a lot to it. Various nooks and crannies all over the place. I'm just kind of zooming in with the camera here. 
all leading up to a central room over here with an elevated dais or dais in what isn't quite a central chamber, but all roads lead here. And this is the kind of thing, place where you could place a great sarcophagus or a boss fight or perhaps some sort of MacGuffin that the players are after. After surviving whatever traps and monsters infest this place, it looks a bit more complicated than it actually is, thanks to all the different looks and panties. I think these little holes are an excellent little detail. They're kind of a great place for hiding beasties in. As you can see, if Target here moves aside slightly, you can't really see into them so well. So something could be hiding in here. It's the kind of place that the players will need to stay alert from. Of course, because I thought I could mention the overhead camera as well, which works quite well for this sort of map as it happens. Through here. And there we go. So, the Pyramid Dungeon. Quite an expansive dungeon map. I'd like to see what you all think of it, actually. See if people have a lot of fun exploring it, see if their players are having fun exploring it, and what sort of shenanigans they can get up to with this sort of thing. But I'll not spoil too much of the map. Let's have a quick look at the last one. And this is the Desert Oasis, another classic fantasy location. Or not necessarily fantasy location, just a sort of desert adventure location. We've got the fresh blue water in the middle of the desert, with the shade of some trees and some rocks as well. And of course, a deep dark cave, which of course has a bit of an interior. If I just pull Targo in here, that will hide the upper parts of this. And inside is a half-buried chest. Very good. But even aside from that, I think this is just a very kind of cool environment to be in. Like I say, I do like desert style environments. So this sort of thing, just a little bit of variety, a little bit of bright colours like the green and the blue in the midst of all this yellow, I think is a pretty cool effect. But now though, let's have a quick look back at the inn. And here we are back in the yawning portal with Targo over here. So this month we are obviously adding in some assets as well, though we've had a bit of a problem with the animated assets getting into 3D canvas. So the scene isn't actually ready for display quite yet. But mostly it's going to be updates to our existing collections. We're adding in a few more things like various sort of books, pottery, miscellaneous, small detail pieces that are maybe slightly less in demand, but are very important for kind of bringing a scene to life, to life, I think. Uh, we're also going to do a slight expansion of our sci-fi set, fill in some missing bits that we had there, and just generally kind of get things a little bit more cleaned up. Something I did see last month was a lot of positive feedback about this interior set that's being used to make the surrounding of this uh, tavern here. So what I'd like to hear is if any of you all had any questions or comments about that in particular. Like if you had any trouble using it, or if there was anything in there that you thought it needed, or anything that you thought was actually really more helpful than you would expect, since this sort of feedback is a massive help to kind of decide on what we want to do for the next month. Though I have greatly appreciated hearing the feedback from you all about this stuff so far. For now though, I'm going to hand back to Bailey, and we're going to carry on from there. I'll see you guys later. All right, Dungeon Draft users, you've got all of the inventory and other components that went into this release. Let's jump into the inventory first. You've got all your magic books. These are scaled down that you see here. I just wanted them to be able to pick up some detail. Uh, you've got all the different vats. These are colorable, all the different magical effects, clouds, and this colorable kind of vat liquid that you can put in, really kind of any vat that's got a circular shape. All of your um, distillers, uh, all of your planets and your orrery components. And then you've got the other orrery pieces as well um, elsewhere. And then you've got these arcane machine vats where the tops, these are actually semi-transparent and these are opaque. You may find use for either of them as you're designing. All of the different components for arcane machines, which you can size up and down quite a bit. All of your, your magic crystal balls, um, that can go in a ton of different places, just general magic objects, all of your parchment spell stuff, also scalable, so you can get some detail in there. Um, all of your magic regents and tincture, tinctures and your magic scrolls and scroll cases. Tons of really cool, I mean, I just love all these scrolls. Like, you can just make a, you know, a 
scatter brush out of these and put them in a scene and they're just super effective and also even some open scrolls so you can kind of leave them out on desks and things like that uh, going up to the next uh, inventory level you've got all of your bookshelves keep in mind these bookshelves are at a perspective so you want to put these at the edges of your scenes uh, all of the different gothic chairs that you can size up and down as well sofas here's some new benches that have some nice textures, including a stone bench. Here's all the uh, completed orries, just lots of different kinds that you can just drop into scenes to make something interesting. All of your telescopes, these are large telescopes, they do go very big. And then lots of really good um, statues uh, that I covered before, but these go super well in lots of different scenes, all these different hands, uh, gargoyles, it's very effective. All your puddles are colorable. All of these globes just for more accent pieces in detail. Your pens and quills just to go with all the right new writing implements. I've also got all these paintings, and these paintings are these are colorable, which means not only can you make them like you know white or brown or whatever, but you can also uh, make them transparent and just have the uh, the the picture frame. And that can be good. You can actually put pictures behind there, drop things in, and uh, and make that, uh, you know, basically put any kind of picture in that you want in a particular scene. They just have to be at a slight perspective. Uh, you've got some rune floors just to give you something to play with. Lots of slime and sludge that are uh, both green and then colorable. Uh, these runes will overlay on top of a floor in case you want some runic overlays. All the new lanterns, these scale up nicely as well. And these may look like duplicates, but these are uh, semi-transparent versus not transparent. Uh, different kinds of mops, brooms, all done in a perspective. These wood railings are great uh, at a slight perspective. These are uh, paths. These, are, these wood railings are also available as walls which you can see up here. I've also got some bookshelf paths and some stair paths that can be resized and scaled nicely. Uh, the railing walls come with a slightly tapered end, so they they work better, I think, for railings in general, as long as you like the, the width. You can't resize walls uh, without modules um, or mods to, to alter dungeon drop behavior, so otherwise stick with the paths if you want to resize them. Uh, wood stair components that you might find helpful. More baskets, just because you can't have enough baskets. They're just good for decor. Same thing with these buckets, both filled with water and not. Some ornate wood pieces that can go great as furniture items or embellishments to walls. You'll see how we use those in a little bit. Uh, other wood pieces, again, for more embellishments. And then you've got these overhead beams. These are what I like to use within Foundry, so I can actually make them overhead, but you may find use for them as well, so I included them. Lots of really good little uh, candles too. These are just super nice for deployment kind of anywhere. All right, and then we get into our uh, actual uh, levels of the tower. This is just an empty tower template in case you want to start your own. Just uh, go in here, create a new level, and use the template as your starting point and it will replicate that and let you build other ones. Here's how we built the library. You can see all the different components, um, where these embellishments came in, just to kind of bring everything together. You can see once you get it all set up and you get it into Foundry and you've got some lighting on it, you know, same thing here, it really makes it pop, right? These may seem relatively you know, still, but once you get them into a good VTT, they really, they really come alive. Uh, all the other pieces that I won't go through in too much detail, um, just to kind of skim through them, the laboratory, the planetarium, the uh, autonom uh, the automaton factory, uh, your beasts and cages. Here's your hangar, the empty version. Here's the hangar with a uh, actual flying machine here. You can see the idea is it's some kind of pulley system that then like launches it uh, out the uh, out the, the open gate. Here's an empty version of the hallways in case you want to decorate your own or have one that's like sparsely decorated. Here's the entrance. So these aren't in any kind of like particular order. Here's your roof. 
Here's your dressed hallways. And that's it for Dungeon Draft. Okay, so that's it. Hope you guys love this release. I hope you like Scenescapes. I hope you like everything else. And uh, thanks for all of you who support us and support the channel and support us on Patreon. You're the reason we get to do all this fun stuff. Let us know in the comments what you'd like to see from us next. If you got inspired by anything, come hit us up on Discord and show us what your uh, ideas you've got. Tell us what you'd like us to produce for Scenescapes uh, in terms of props and things like that. We are totally all over it. So uh, with that, thanks everybody and have fun making your maps.